Good afternoon, class. We are looking at analytic geometry. Here's inverse trig functions, part one. So the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent functions, the objectives are <clears throat> find the exact value of inverse sine, cosine, or tangent function, find an approximate value of an inverse sine function, use properties of inverse function to find the exact values of certain composite functions, find the inverse function of a trigonometric function, solve the equation involving inverse trigonometric functions. So we have seen properties of trig functions, starting with the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals one. And then a general circle, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, for example, in the case of a unit circle, sine t is y. In this case, sine t or theta is y over r, because in this case, r is one. Then we have periodic functions. All of them are periodic. And the period is two pi, except tangent and cotangent, which is uh, pi. All of them are odd functions, except uh, cosine, and with cosine goes, goes secant. And these are fundamental identities, Pythagorean identities, quotient identities, and reciprocal identities we should be very comfortable with so we can move on. When it comes to graph of sine and, fun and cosine functions, we cut that into four parts because as you can see, we have one, two, three, four arcs. One, two, three, four arcs. So we cut the period t is normally two pi or at least for the basic one. And then we look at the end points that gives us four arcs, five key points. Also the relationship between sine and cosine is that uh, Sine is the same as cosine that has been shifted to the right by power over two. So sine is cosine of x minus power over two. And in general, when y uh, when y is sine or cosine, t is two pi, amplitude is one. But if it's a sine omega x or a cosine omega x, t is two pi over omega, the amplitude is absolute value of uh, a. And again, we continue with this concept. If we had a phase shift, as I mentioned, two pi over omega, so we have the formulas in general. Y equals A sine omega X minus Y plus B. We take the omega out, looks like that. And that gives us the phase shift. A sine omega times X minus Y over omega plus B. And in some text, we may use a slightly a different format, but ultimately they are the same. As long as we understand, this is the amplitude. This gives result to period B two pi over omega. This is the phase shift and B shifts it up or down along the Y axis. Now the inverse sine, cosine and tangent function 6.3. Review of properties of functions and their inverses. Only one-to-one -one functions have inverse functions. F of F inverse of X equals X where x is in the domain of f inverse of x and f inverse o f of x is also x, where in this case, x is in the domain of f of x, the second part in, in, in fact. So the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse and the range of f of x is the domain of f inverse. That's the relationship between inverse functions. The graph of f of x and f inverse are symmetric about the line y equals x when graphed on the same axis. Composition of inverse functions, f of inverse of x equals f inverse o f of x, and both of them are equal to x. When we look at uh, any trigonometric functions, including sine, it is a periodic function. It fails a horizontal line test, and therefore it's not one-to-one. -one. In order to make it one-to-one, -one, we restrict it. Remember, if we go from negative to positive infinity, here's the range. It is not a one-to-one -one function. If we restrict it to this, it becomes one 
to one. And the reason we do that, instead of going from zero to pi, we want to make sure the uh, entire range of negative one to one is covered. That's why we go from negative power two to power two. So this is not a one to one function. Now, this one, the restriction on the domain, we go from negative power two to power two. This is a one to one function. Same range. So how would we graph the inverse function? It's very simple. Look at these three easy points. Uh, by the way, y equals sine inverse of x. That means x equals sine y. x is between negative 1 and 1, and y is between negative power 2 and power 2. In other words, domain becomes range, range becomes domain. Now, write three pairs, minus power 2, negative 1, 0, 0, and power 2, 1. So now, interchange x and y. That's the reason. Because we interchange them, it becomes symmetric with respect to y equals x, because as you change x to y, that's what happens. So negative 1, uh, negative power 2, 0, 0 doesn't change, 1 power 2. And when you do that, if you graph it very carefully, you see this is the sign, OK? And you see that this is the sign inverse. So negative one pi over two, one pi over two, zero, zero doesn't change. We want to find the exact value of an inverse sine function, the warm up example, sine inverse of one. The moment you see that, you're going to write this is equal to theta. And so reminding everybody that y equals sine inverse of x, that means x equals sine y. x is between negative 1 and 1, y is between negative power 2 and power 2. So let's set this equal to something, for example, theta. By definition, sine of theta is 1. And we know theta is power 2. It is a common arc. So we just Pay attention to the restriction. What is sine inverse of negative one half? We do the same thing. We set it equal to x, y, z, theta. By definition, sine of theta must be one half. By definition of an inverse function, everybody. Therefore, theta must be pi over six. <clears throat> By the way, it's important to know an equation like this from 0 to 2 pi has two answers. But when we say we start with the inverse, there is a unique solution. We don't want to mix them up. Sine inverse of negative 1 half. Again, let it be anything you want. Pick a variable, for example, theta. By definition of an inverse function, Sine of theta must be negative one half. Theta must be minus pi over six. Again, restriction means the fourth and the first quadrant. Example, to find an approximate value of an inverse sine function answer in radians with four decimals. Since one third is not a common angle or arc, we have to go with calculators. Of course, if you just for the sake of argument, if you set this equal to anything, for example, x, let's say this time, 
that means sine x is one third. That's the meaning of it. However, it doesn't help us because it's not a common arc. So we're going to put it into a calculator, sine inverse of one third, and it gives us the answer. And if you want four decimals, one, two, three, four, you stop at eight, next to it is three, it doesn't change, so 0.3398. Now, bear in mind, this is in radians. Same thing here, this is not a common arc. If I said equals to x, that means sine x is negative one fourth, doesn't do us any good. We put it into a calculator and we want uh, four decimals, one, two, three, four. Uh, next to six is eight. We change it to seven, so minus 0. 0.2527. So you put it into a calculator, sine inverse of negative one-fourth. Sine of sine inverse of 0.5. Now, it's important to know uh, when you look at composite function of inverse functions, they undo each other as long as we have the right domain. So f inverse of f of x equals sine inverse of sine x equals x. And then you pay attention to this. X must be between negative power to and power to. So you pay attention to this domain for sine X, the restriction that we made up. Sine of sine inverse of X equals X. Now you pay attention to the domain of sine inverse of X. That means you look at the range of the sine, which is between negative one and one. That works out in that manner. And therefore, for this question, the answer is 0 0.5. If you put that into a calculator, you'll see sine, sine inverse of 0. 0.5 equals 0. 0.5. It's a very straightforward, everybody. Now, what happens here? Because we have the sine inverse here, this must be in the domain of sine inverse. This is undefined, we don't have it. Because when we go back to this, this x has to be between negative one and one. And even if you put it into a calculator, it gives you an error. In other words, you can think of it this way. If you set this part, you said it's equal to theta. By definition, it means sine of theta is 1.8, and this has no solutions. No solutions ever. So if you happen to have a calculator, you check the mode, you put it in radians, and now let's say sine inverse, second, sine, one third, one divided by three, close parentheses, Enter, look at the number that you have here. This is what we have here. So that's how you use it, calculator. So again, second sign 
gives you the sine inverse. Just to show how calculators work. Find the exact value of the following composite functions. And again, reminding everybody, it's very important to know. If you're looking at sine inverse of sine x, this x belongs to sine and the restriction is between negative power two and power two. This one, sine of sine inverse of x, this belongs to its inverse. That means the range, therefore x must be between negative one and one. So in this case, you are working with this area. Is this within negative power two to power two? And the answer is yes. Therefore, it just comes out as power eight. What about sine inverse of sine five pi over eight? <clears throat> it would be five pi over eight if it's within an acceptable, you know, interval. So five pi over eight, is it between negative power two and uh, pi over two? Please understand four pi over eight is pi over two. So this is larger than pi over two. And therefore it is not an element of this notation means an element. This means not an element. An element. And of course, the line through that is negating that. Therefore, the answer is not 5 pi over 8. So what do you have to do? Find an angle in the interval for which sine theta equals sine of five pi over eight. Now five pi over eight is in the second quadrant and it makes it positive. And the reference arc is three pi over eight. So it's the same as three pi over eight in the following manner. Sine theta is positive because we are looking at quadrant two, five pi over two, it's in quadrant two. So sine, We're looking at of five pi over eight. We notice that this is the reference arc. Let me call that theta sub r. Okay, so it's the same as that one. So sine has this reference arc. So three pi over eight, three pi over eight. They both have the same answer. It's the y coordinate. Remember that if you look at the. Uh, Unit circle, even if it's R, still works out the same way. And so, sine inverse of sine of five pi over eight is the same as sine inverse of sine of three pi over eight. The answer is three pi over eight. So basically, <clears throat> when you deal with a case like that, you just make sure you know the quadrant and the reference angle and whether you go with the positive or negative. If by any chance this was in the, the third quadrant and negative, we would have to go with a negative three pi over eight. Because of course X is between negative and positive power. Let's look at cosine function. Cosine function, just like sine function, it is not a one-to-one -one function. Y equals cosine X, X is between negative and positive infinity, Y is between negative one and not a one-to-one -one function. So if we restrict it for this part, so that it's gonna go from zero to pi instead, the restriction makes it a one-to-one -one function. So we have the same function, the same range, because we have to cover the same range. This time we go zero to pi, Okay, uh, and that will cover everything we need. So y equals cosine inverse of x, x is cosine y by definition of inverse functions. Therefore, the domain, be, this range becomes the domain, negative one to one, and the domain becomes the range, 
And if you look at those three pairs, 0, 1, pi over 2, 0, pi negative 1, on the graph of the cosine x, now we are going to interchange x and y. This becomes 1, 0. This becomes 0 power 2. This becomes negative 1 pi. Now all you have to do is use those three pairs. So we have 0, 1, pi over 2, 0, pi negative 1. So the red one is the answer. And of course, symmetric with respect to the line y equals x as expected. Uh, cosine inverse of zero. So we're going to find the exact answer. Those are common arcs. This one, we're going to write, let it be equal to theta. By definition, cosine theta is zero. We should know the answer is pi over two. This one, set it again equal to theta. By definition, cosine of theta must be one half common arc. The answer is pi over three. Set this one equal to theta. By definition, cosine of theta is negative one half this time. So remember, for one half pi over three in essence is the reference arc. So this would be the reference arc for this. Negative. And we are going to go from 0 to pi. As you know, in the second quadrant, it is negative. So all you have to do, say, pi minus pi over 3. So the answer for this would be pi minus pi over 3. Let me just write that, how we get that. You use this as reference arc, and then say my pi minus pi over three, and that's how you arrive. This one, again, let's set it equal to theta. By defi definition, cosine of theta must be negative square root of two over two. First. I want to discuss square root of 2 over 2. We should know the answer is pi over 4. Let me just write that, reminding everyone. We should know that cosine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, like sine, the same thing. So all you have to do, go with the second quadrant and subtract this from pi again. So pi minus pi over 4 gives us 3 pi over 4. So theta is 3 pi over 4. Again, I'm assuming everybody is comfortable with uh, common arcs. Cosine inverse of cosine of pi, pi over six. Pay attention to this fact. Cosine inverse of cosine of x. This x belongs to the restricted domain of zero to pi. That's what we have. Pi, pi over six is between zero to, zero to pi, yes. So the answer is five pi over six. Cosine, cosine inverse of point two over here. The choice is between negative 1 and 1. If this number is between negative 1 and 1, the answer is itself. And yes, it is. You don't have to do anything. So you really should know the concept. And uh, is 5 pi over 4 between 0 and pi? So what's happening here, this one is larger than pi. It's in the third quadrant. So it's not, it's 
it's not in the given interval of 0 to 5 over 4. So the very first thing you should notice is that the reference arc, of course, is pi over 4. Okay, that's a theta sub r reference arc. In the third quadrant, in the third quadrant, cosine is negative, like the second quadrant. So in the second quadrant, this would be pi minus pi over 4. So this in quadrant 2 would be Three pi over four. So find an angle with the same cosine value and cosine of five pi over four and three pi over four are the same. Therefore, the answer is cosine of three pi over four. Again, I believe the reference arc is really helpful. When you look at part D, Remember, with the cosine inverse, this number should be in between. It's not. It's undefined because 2 doesn't belong to the interval of negative 1 to 1, and therefore not except undefined. The inverse tangent function tan inverse of x, again, just like the other two, it is not a one-to-one -one function. We have y equals tan x. x is between negative to positive infinity, and x can't be n pi. Remember, x equals n pi are the equation uh, for, um, you know, uh, vertical asymptotes. And uh, y is between negative to positive infinity, and it's not a one-to-one -one function. It's not it. Or you can say uh, two and plus one times power to all. Two and plus one times pi over two. Okay, so that one is important to uh, understand. Now the restriction, if we pick one cycle between negative power two and power two, it works. Now this restriction makes this a one-to-one -one function. So y equals tan x is not a one-to-one -one function. When we restrict the domain between negative power one, power two and power two, and the endpoints are not included. It's just like sine, but the endpoints are not included. The range remains the same, and it makes it a one-to-one -one function. So if we want to uh, mention this concept, y equals tan inverse of x, x equals tan y, x is between negative infinity and infinity. See, y, the range for tangent, and now the domain for its inverse from negative to positive infinity. Domain between negative power 2 and power 2, range between negative power 2 and power 2. So you put a few... Uh, points, okay, for example, this is 0, 0, we have pi over 4, 1, negative pi over 4, negative 1, the vertical asymptotes, x equals minus pi over 2, x equals pi over 2, so we write that, so this becomes negative 1, negative pi over 4, this doesn't have 0, 0, this becomes 1 pi over 4, now it, this becomes a horizontal asymptote, y equals negative pi over 4, this becomes a horizontal asymptote, also, and if you graph it, it will look something like this with horizontal asymptotes.
We want to find those. We're going to do the same thing. We start. We want to find the exact values. We start with setting this equal to theta. Uh, by definition, tan of theta is one. Common arc theta is pi over four. Same thing here. By definition, tan of theta is minus square root of three. And again, a common arc. Remember, tan of theta equals square root of three, we get pi over three. And if it's negative, we get negative pi over three. Part C said it equal to theta. By definition, tan of theta equals square root of three over three, a common arc, pi over six. Set this one equal to theta, tan of theta square root of three over three, again, a common arc. If this is pi over six, this must be negative pi over six. All right, so all the equations involving inverse trig function. So two cosine inverse of x is pi over two. Obviously, we're gonna divide both sides by two. If I divide both sides by two, I get pi over four. So by definition, x is cosine of pi over four, which is square root of two over two. Divide by three. Sine inverse of x is pi over six. By definition, x is sine of pi over six, which is a common arc. And that's one half. Five sine inverse of x minus two pi equals two sine inverse of x minus three pi. I hope, I hope you can see that I can move this one this way. I can move this one this way. So this becomes plus two pi. And the right side becomes negative pi. This becomes negative two and they add up to three sine inverse. Divide both sides by three. When you isolate sine inverse, now you can go with the definition x is a sine of negative pi over three. By the way, you could write this as minus sine of pi over three because it's an odd function. Either way is fine. The answer is square root of three over two for sine of pi over three. Negative in front of it makes it minus square root of three over two, or you should know that this is negative square root of three two over two because it's a common arc. Find the inverse function, f inverse of f of x equals two sine x minus one, find the range of f and the domain and range of f inverse. And by the way, the domain for this function is given. So you already know this is the range for the other one, just for the sake of argument. So what is the process? Uh, we call this y to make life easy. Step one. Step two, interchange x and y. So this is x, this is two sine y minus one. We're gonna move the negative one Okay, and we add one, and then we're gonna divide by two. So we get sine y equals x plus one divided by two. 
now we can apply the inverse function paying attention to y equals sine inverse means x equals sine y so sine y equals x plus one over two that means sine inverse of whatever you have here sine inverse of this is this sine inverse of the expression x plus one over two is y replace the y with sine inverse and these two functions are inverse of each other and domain of one is range of the other because the domain is given here for f of x the range for this fun function is the same okay recall the domain of f is the range of f inverse and the range of f is the domain of f inverse so we have two of them we want to find the other two We can do it two ways and I'm gonna show you both ways. So sine inverse of x plus one over two. Remember the domain is between negative one and one. So whatever this expression is, everybody, whatever this one is, it's supposed to be between negative one and one. So pay attention that we are using this, okay, everybody. And this says x, which means any expression here. I'm going to multiply by two, okay? So you're going to multiply both sides by two. And you are going to subtract one. And this is the domain of F inverse. Domain of F inverse makes it range of F. And we are done. But I want to quickly show you a, a slightly different method just for the sake of argument. So we're done. We don't have to look at the second or third method. I'd like to show them to you just so, so you're exposed to that. So why is 2 sine x minus 1? which makes sine x uh, between y, okay, so you move the one, you get y plus one uh, over two. And we know sine x has a range of negative one to one. So this must be between negative one and one. So let's multiply by two. So if I multiply by two, I get negative two here, I get positive two here. Then I'm gonna subtract one from every side and I get the same thing as I got here, okay? So that was the second method. So a quick recap here, solve for sine x you know sine is supposed to be between negative one and one, right? Because y value. All right, um, here's the third method. We know sine is between negative one and one. Let's make it look like this, multiplied by two. So multiply this one by two, this one by two, this one by two. Multiply everything. by two. So, so far we got two sine x. How do you get negative one? Subtract one from everywhere. And you say two sine x minus one. One, two, three. They are all identical. Three different methods. Okay, everybody. All right, what about this function? f of x is two cosine of three x plus two. We're gonna find the inverse function. So first, we call this y. Second, we change this to x, we change this to y. And again, please remember, this is the step that gives you the inverse. However, you solve for y. And the first thing you do, you divide by two. Now that you have cosine and nothing else on the right, then 
by definition of an inverse, whatever this is, is cosine inverse of the left side. So according to this, cosine inverse of x over 2 is 3y plus 2. You're solving for y. You are going to subtract 2, so minus 2. You are going to divide by 3. And then you get y, or f inverse of x, is cosine inverse of x over 2 divided by 3, minus 2 divided by 3. So this is what you get. So this is the inverse function you're looking for. Domain. Here's domain of the given function. That's what they gave us. So the range of f inverse must be the same. Okay. According to this, the range of f inverse must be the same. Now, domain of F inverse whatever this expression is has to be between negative 1 and 1. Remember? X has to be between negative 1 and 1. In this case, X over 2 is the argument of cosine inverse. So if I multiply by 2, this becomes negative 2, this becomes x, this becomes 2. So x is between negative 2 and 2. That means domain of f inverse, x is between negative 2 and 2, which is the same as range of f. Range of f y is between negative 2 and 2. Uh, let's also look at the second method. So y is this. And we know it has to be between negative one and one. Cosine of three X plus two must be between negative one and one. We want two of that. So multiply this one by two. So class cosine is between negative one and one. This one has two. So I'm gonna multiply everything by two. So two cosine three X plus two is less than or equal to two. And this is what? This is Y. So that gives us the same range. Or the F as expected. Uh, find the inverse of f of x equals 2 tan x minus 3, and the domain is given. We change the f of x to y. Interchange x and y. We're going to move this to the other side, becomes plus 3, and we're going to divide by 2. And we get tan y equals x plus 3 over 2. And now, according to this, we can say tan of this side, tan inverse of this side is y, and change the y, call it f inverse. We are done. Let's go with the domain and range. This is given as the domain of the function f of x. So the same thing, according to this, must be the range for f inverse. So x is between these two numbers for f of x. Y is between these two numbers for f inverse. And so what is the domain of f inverse? 
remember. When we look at the inverse function, tan inverse of x, this expression, whatever it is, class, it's important to understand this expression is between negative to positive infinity. Therefore, this expression is between negative and positive infinity. Now, if we multiply by two, it really doesn't change. Uh, we still have minus infinity, okay? Let me just write it here. We still have minus infinity less than or equal to x plus three less than or equal to two times infinity. Let me just put the two. Minus two infinity, okay? And negative infinity is the same. So you move this, you get minus three here, you get minus three here. Still nothing changes. And here's the reason class. Infinity times two is infinity. Infinity times three is infinity. Minus three or minus 3,000 makes no difference. So that is the domain which makes the range of F. Here's the second method. We go here and we say y, which is this expression, must be between negative and positive infinity. Because tangent, is, my apologies, we are interested in that. We tan, we know it to be between negative and positive infinity. Let's multiply it by two doesn't change because minus two infinity and two infinity is still negative. Now add any number. In this case, we're going to add negative three or subtract three. It doesn't change that and we can get to the same answer. F of x is three cosine x plus one and the domain is given. So we are going to change F of x to y. That's the first thing we do. We interchange X and Y. So we move the one becomes X minus one, we divide by three. And now that we are here, okay, then we can say that y is cosine inverse of this expression. And we call it f inverse. Uh, domain is given for f of x. That means range is given for its inverse. So range of f inverse is given. So the same thing, okay? So again, x is between 0 and pi for f of x. y is between 0 and pi for that. This is 0, not minus 0. Minus zero doesn't mean anything, so zero. Now, domain of F inverse, if you look at this expression, going back to X is between negative one and one, that means this or this, doesn't matter must be between negative one and one. So we are going to uh, multiply by three. We are going to add one. X is between negative two and four. That means the range for F also must be between negative two and four. Second method, we go here and we say this must be, cosine must be between negative one and one. Cosine is between negative one and one. So if I want three cosine x, I'm gonna multiply this one by three. So this becomes negative three, this becomes three cosine x, this is three. Now I want a plus one, let me add a plus one. Okay, so let's add one to all of them. 
this becomes 3 cosine x plus 1, this becomes negative 2, this becomes 4. And now, as you can see, the same as what we had here. 